7.30 p.m. Good evening, I'm Chiu Wee Lin on News 5 Tonight. Singapore reclassifies various medical devices after feedback from importers and doctors. It helps faster access to products for the patient. SMRT streamlines its SOP to allow a swifter response to emergencies in the wake of the December train disruptions. DMD is now on Facebook and Twitter to better connect with the public. We find out how successful he's been so far. And tight security in Bahrain as F1 teams take to the track. But one team affected by unrest yesterday has pulled out of second practice. It will soon be easier, faster and in some cases cheaper for medical devices to be registered here. Changes have been made after importers and doctors raised concerns when a new framework took effect this year. The Health Sciences Authority says the changes, which it calls radical, are aimed at Class A and B medical devices. These account for about 70% of all medical device applications received by the HSA. For Class A, another 2,700 devices will be added, bringing the total number to 4,700. These include wheelchairs, surgical face masks and examination gloves. And for the moderate risk devices in Class B, such as contact lenses and hearing aids, two additional faster access routes with lower fees will be introduced from September 1st. For products on the immediate registration route, they have to be approved by two of HSA's reference agencies and marketed without safety concerns for at least three years. And for products that only fulfill one of these criteria, they will be on the expedited registration route. Both routes will see registration fees cut by $900 to $1,400. Manufacturers say these adjustments will help streamline current processes. It significantly can reduce the volume of work which lands up at the HSA and therefore we expect a, a positive um, say, effect on the speed of registration which I think is, is critical for us because it helps faster access to products for the patients. HSA stressed that these changes aim to strike a balance between maintaining stakeholder needs and patient safety. We're using a risk-based approach and so when we apply these three factors of referencing against uh, key independent regulatory agencies, when we look at the history of safety of a product and when we increase the post-market surveillance, we are confident that we can expedite and increase uh, more opportunities to bring in products but without compromising patient safety for Singaporeans. Now the Health Sciences Authority will work with the Singapore Manufacturers Federation to work out a possible concierge service. Now this aims to provide companies with a a range of services which include training and consultancy which will help companies in their pre and post marketing needs. Well, medical professionals and product suppliers have welcomed the changes, saying this will ease problems they face with high registration fees and longer than expected approval timelines. A huge backlog of applications to register medical devices meant both doctor and supplier had to deal with product delays. And when it came to low-risk devices, some medical professionals felt they should not be so tightly regulated. With the new changes, all Class A devices except sterile ones will be exempted from registration. A lot of these Class A devices were like bandages, were probably uh, quite easily viewed as not a safety issue. So, therefore, by bypassing this regulation, it is a positive role in terms of not compromising the patient's care and also probably will reduce costs in terms of bringing it in. Besides delays, other concerns faced by suppliers were high registration fees, which meant that some products were stopped from being imported. We have been selling some of the products before and uh, we have to virtually stop bringing in the products because um, you know the registration fee is actually quite an issue for us especially for some of the items that are uh, you know Singapore is actually quite a small market for us so sometimes the volume is not substantial enough for us to consider the registrations. For class B medical devices registration fees will be reduced. The challenge for us is, is if it becomes costly uh, we will have to really rationalize whether we can bring in such product into this market uh, if we once we're not, not able to bring in product then the source of new product and new business and new growth are, are not, not going to be there further enhancements are also being planned for the higher risk class c and d devices more details will be out at the end of this year 
In other headlines, train operator SMRT has revised its protocol to be more responsive in the event of a crisis. Staff now no longer have to wait for senior management to activate what's known as the Rail Incident Management Plan. This emerged at the public inquiry into last year's big breakdowns on the North-South Line. The focus today was on the response to those incidents. Over 120,000 commuters were affected in the major disruption on 15 December, and day five of the public inquiry heard testimonies from affected station managers, saying crowd control was a challenge given the limited manpower. Mr Tan Chit Siang of Marina Bay Station also highlighted the station's outdated plan. He said a particular exit, which had been closed for years, was not accounted for in the plan. And this could have impacted the flow of directing passengers to bus bridging services. Lack of information from the Operations Control Centre or OCC was also raised. Mr Lam Kok Sun, seen here in the background, was the manager on duty at the OCC on 15 December. He told the court how his hands were full during the disruption. As the OCC focused on rectifying faults and getting passengers out of trains, no one was monitoring the number of people at affected stations. This meant more passengers could have been asked to alight at stations that were already crowded. COI Chairman Judge Tan Siong Tai said given that the manager of the op centre can be overwhelmed by such situations, there should be another dedicated personnel to monitor the crowd situation at affected stations to ensure passenger safety. The additional help needed to better manage crowds is now supposed to arrive faster in the event of a disruption. That's because instead of waiting for senior management, OCC managers have now been given the authority to activate the Rail Incident Management Plan. Prime Minister Lee Hsien Lung has launched his own Facebook page and Twitter account. As of 9.15pm, about seven hours after he started, he had more than 12,000 likes on Facebook and over 3,500 followers on Twitter. Our reporter Imelda Saad has more. Now, there are many Lee Hsien Lung Facebook pages around, but they're all fan pages. This is the real deal. And Mr. Lee said that his staff will help him maintain the page, but he will try to post as often as possible, and he will sign off his post with his initials. Now, there are many other MPs and ministers who have their own Facebook account, and Mr. Lee said that his colleagues encouraged him to set up his own Facebook, and having watched them, he decided to join in the fun. Now, beyond that, what this really is about is the Prime Minister trying to engage Singaporeans online as more young Singaporeans take their discussions to cyberspace. Now in his post, Mr Lee said that he will use the Facebook page to talk about some of the things he's doing, thinking about and would like to hear from Singaporeans. He's also said that he wants to use the Facebook page to help shape ideas and understanding of what can be done to improve lives. But before you post, there are some house rules which state that offensive comments and personal attacks may be removed. As you can see, there are numerous likes and comments on this page, some ranging from the informal to the encouraging, and others urging the Prime Minister to really take the opportunity to listen to the feedback he receives. And Mr. Lee adds that he's a Facebook newbie and has asked users to offer their advice and be patient with him. And just a short while ago, PM Lee posted a personal note to those who've left comments on his Facebook page. He said he's happy so many people have seen his page and that even overseas Singaporeans have posted comments, including one he called an old SAF comrade whom he hadn't heard from in a while. In world news, Formula One cars have taken to the track in Bahrain for the first time on practice day for the controversial Grand Prix. Security has been tightened with police making their presence felt in the capital Manama and on the highway leading to the circuit. Fresh violence broke out overnight but in areas far from the F1 action. Protesters have threatened days of rage to coincide with the Formula One weekend. The government has been hoping to use the race to show that life is back to normal after the pro-democracy rising started last year. Well, this afternoon's practice sessions went on as planned. Current championship leader Lewis Hamilton topped the first session for McLaren, while Nico Rosberg of Mercedes was fastest in second practice. And the Force India team skipped the second session, partly to get back to their hotel before dark. They were shaken yesterday when one of their cars was caught up in a firebomb clash between police and protesters. 
The former treasurer of Indonesia's ruling Democrat Party has been found guilty of corruption and sentenced to nearly five years in jail in a case that's a major embarrassment for President Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono. Muhammad Nazaruddin was convicted of taking half a million US dollars to help a construction company win a contract to build an athlete's dormitory for last year's Southeast Asian Games. The judge said he's tainted the image of a government that's trying to fight corruption. The sentence is less than the seven years demanded by prosecutors. Nazaruddin has denied the charges and is considering whether to appeal. But he may soon be back in court because investigations uncovered other alleged cases of graft involving government projects. Our Indonesia bureau chief has more on the implications. Well, there is a growing public perception right now that the KPK would not go that far uh, to prosecute senior leaders in the president's party. Now, during the trial, however, there were testimonies from Nazaruddin as well as other witnesses implicating Democrat Party's chairman and deputy secretary general. But there seemed to be some reluctance to pursue the matter further. Now, the Indonesian public is, of course, uh, putting a lot of pressure on the prosecutors, although uh, the president has said he would not shield any of his party members from the law. Skeptics are, however, not convinced. Uh, there's too much at stake, of course, politically. They believe uh, there are important people who will be protected and there are those who will, who will be fall guys too. President Yudo Yono cannot run for another term uh, in the 2014 election, so the popular rating doesn't affect his political future. But his Democrat Party is suffering badly. They really need to launch a massive strategy uh, if they intend to do well in the 2014 elections. Well, we're taking a quick break, but coming up on News 5. It saddens me to think that we have to go. Three food outlets along Yochukang Road are being made to move out for allegedly causing traffic congestion. And this Russian national treasure is heading Singapore's way, but she started her Asian tour in a rather unlikely place. Welcome back. China is denying allegations that it assisted North Korea with its missile program. At issue is a missile launcher unveiled in Pyongyang last weekend. Some Western military experts say Beijing may have supplied technology to build it, and in doing so would have violated a UN ban. U.S. Defense Secretary Leon Panetta also said he was sure there's been some help coming from China, though he admitted he didn't know the extent of it. The U.S. State Department, however, says it will take Beijing at their word that they're abiding by the sanctions. And next, the first sign of serious discord between government and opposition in Myanmar after recent historic by-elections. Aung San Suu Kyi and other members of her National League for Democracy say they'll boycott the opening of Parliament on Monday when they were set to be sworn in as MPs. The reason is a single word in the swearing-in oath. It says safeguard the constitution, referring to the constitution drawn up by Myanmar's former military rulers. The NLD wanted a change to respect and sent a top official to the capital, Naypyidaw, to argue its case. But the government has rejected its appeal. The issue is now unlikely to be resolved by Monday. And here in Singapore, the ringleader in the God of Hell rape case has been sentenced to between 18 months and three years of reformative training. The boy, now aged 18, pretended to be possessed by the Chinese god so that he and his friends could commit rape. He was 14 at the time and cannot be named to protect the identities of his victims, who were 14 and 15. The court heard that he was rejected by one of the two girls, so he claimed to be possessed and told them that they would be punished by the god of hell if they didn't have sex with him. He also made them perform sex acts on three of his friends aged 12 to 15. In mitigation, his defense lawyer had previously cited his age, low IQ, and the fact that the prosecution had been delayed. This boy is the last to be sentenced. The others were sent to, for reformative training or put on probation. A man was killed and three others hurt after an explosion on a tugboat this morning. The boat was moored at a shipyard off Benoit Road. 
All the victims were Indonesian crewmen. They all suffered burns. Initial investigations show that they were in the engine room when the blast happened, and they were doing hot work, referring to work that involves flammable material or that could be a fire hazard. Officers from the Civil Defense Force and Manpower Ministry were at the site today. The National Environment Agency has launched two new applications to help the public better monitor their energy consumption and adjust their usage to save on costs. This application, called the Energy Audit, allows households to find out which appliances use the most energy and work out their monthly costs. Meanwhile, the Life Cycle Cost Calculator estimates the overall costs that different models of appliances will incur over their lifespan. The Environment Minister says this is part of inculcating good environmental habits and empowering the public. On the cards is another app that will enable people to report on ground situations like flood risks. We are working with a commercial company to launch another app which will allow people to take photographs or to send us feedback and literally with no more than four clicks send the information to us so that we can act on it and we can resolve it. Three eating outlets along Yo Chu Kang Road will have to move out next month. The Urban Redevelopment Authority says it has received numerous complaints from nearby residents about traffic and parking problems in the area. The outlets, a roti prata shop, a shop selling Taiwanese porridge and a seafood restaurant, attract about 300 customers a day. Many apparently park illegally anywhere they can. The shop owners have taken measures like offering valet parking, but URA says this didn't solve the problem. It has rejected an appeal by the shop owners to stay. I've got people who have studied at the roadside school. They come back to the Prata house after 20 years, saying that they want to reminisce the old times. It saddens me to think that we have to go. We've got so many workers, about 28 workers. Where are they going to locate to? And just ahead, changes to the Singapore Sports Awards with two new honours and secret balloting for winners. Also, Buckingham Palace gets a fun facelift and who better to feature in it than the Queen? business news, Maple Tree Logistics Trust will continue to look overseas for acquisitions. It plans to grow its portfolio in existing markets like South Korea and Malaysia. It's also exploring opportunities in new markets like Indonesia, Thailand and Australia. The trust currently has about 25% market share of logistics assets in Singapore. Capita Commercial Trust, which holds office properties including Capital Tower and HSBC Building, says demand for office space is currently subdued. For the first quarter of this year, its net property income was almost flat at about $70 million. The trust has reported a distribution per unit of 1.9 cents for the quarter. And here are the market numbers. Singapore Sports Awards will be given out on the 29th of May and for the first time, the winners are being decided by secret ballot. It heightens the whole sports award when you have this mystery and, and the anxiety, the excitement all works out to the night itself. Huh? Um, we thought why not and of course we thought about how best to do it and I think we've found a way of doing it which will keep the name of the winners uh, tight-lipped. For Sportsman of the Year, swimmer Joseph Schooling and shooter Zhang Jin have been shortlisted. Shuttler Fu Mingtian, bowler Daphne Tan, swimmer Tao Li and paddler Feng Tianwei are the finalists for Sportswoman of the Year. For Team of the Year, Singapore's female bowling and wushu teams have made the cut. And bowling's William Wu and sailing's Fernando Abulu are contenders for Coach of the Year. In football, Atletico Madrid and Sporting Lisbon have won their Europa League semi-final first leg matches. Falcao scored a double to inspire Atletico to a 4-2 victory over Spanish rivals Valencia. 
The 2010 winners have a definite advantage going into next week's return leg at the Messiah. But Valencia are not completely out of the running yet, thanks to their two away goals. And an all Spanish final was looking to be on the cards until Sporting came from behind in the other semi in Lisbon to beat Athletic Bilbao. They take a slender 2 1 lead into the second leg. And she's just a baby, but one that's 42,000 years old. I'm talking about a mummified mammoth which has left her home in a Russian museum to go on tour in Asia. And she made her debut in a rather unusual place. Hong Kong is getting a taste of the Ice Age in the middle of the swanky IFC shopping mall. And the main attraction is this 42,000 year old baby woolly mammoth mummy. Researchers estimate she died when she was just one month old. Though pint sized, only 150 centimeters tall, this rare discovery is getting a giant following. I never imagined we can witness that creature nowadays. This, I, I guess that should be up to a million years ago.、Yeah. This is amazing. <laughs> I like the baby mammoth because I think he was cute. The Siberian specimen was found frozen in the Arctic tundra in 2007 by sons of a reindeer herder. She was named Luba after the herder's wife, which means love in Russian. With her remains at near perfect condition and even her mother's milk still in her stomach, researchers are calling Luba the best preserved baby woolly mammoth specimen ever found. Luba received plenty of TLC from Russian authorities to properly preserve her. She was mummified by being submerged in ethanol and formalin to remove all moisture from her remains, which also made her lighter and easier to transport. She'll be on tour throughout 2013 with planned stops in China, Indonesia, and Singapore. Leslie Tang, Channel News Asia, Hong Kong. And finally, Britain's Queen Elizabeth has received the royal treatment in a unique form of art to celebrate her Diamond Jubilee. Giant pictures of her have been beamed onto Buckingham Palace. And look closer, they're a montage of 200,000 self portraits by British children. The images are also being shown for 24 hours on massive screens across the UK. The Queen is marking her 60th year on the throne. This has been News 5 tonight. Good night.